Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 67. This is the first episode in a new series that will explore the Kingdom Fungi. And I'm going to begin with an in-depth study of the evolutionary history of the fungi. It's a long history, because the earliest fungal ancestors are around one and a half billion years old, and an explosion in more complex fungi began around the same time as the Cambrian explosion. Fungal history is also a mysterious history, because for the vast majority of this time, the body of a fungus, the mycelia, doesn't persist long enough to mineralize. It decays really fast. And as a result, the fossil record, especially the early fossil record, is really sparse on fungi, which has thrown their early evolutionary history and their ancestry into a fog of the unknown. The bones of animals fossilize way easier than hyphae and mycelia and mushrooms, so the animal fossil record is uh, relatively much more extensive. Although this isn't to say that a fungi can never fossilize. They can, and they do, and we've found quite a few of them and we've studied them, and we've learned a little bit, you know, as much as we can, about the fungal lineage, even though the data is still painfully sparse. Fungal mycelia is soft, with no hard parts, no shells, no thick cell walls like you'd find in a tree, no beaks like you would find in an octopus or a squid. The fungal body is very soft, and the fungi tend to live in wet, warm, dark places. These conditions are optimal for decomposition. So a dead organism that's composed of a loose assemblage of soft strings of single cells is going to decay incredibly quickly. Geological processes like fossilization can take an extremely long time, hundreds of thousands to millions of years for the fossil to fully form, and even then, that only happens under the right conditions. So what are the conditions that are necessary for a fungal specimen to be fossilized? Now, a fossilized mushroom would have to be rapidly engulfed in sediment or ash, or something that would surround it in a particle matrix. This matrix seals off the mushroom from oxygen and bacteria that would promote decomposition. The pressure would build up as more sediment was deposited over and over again over millions of years, and the fungi could become a fossil through the standard permineralization process. The mushroom wouldn't decay because it got flash frozen, or uh, more or less completely covered by the initial flood of sediment. Most fungal fossils are created when something like this happens to a tree or to some other plant that has a symbiotic relationship with a fungus. The, the tree or the, the plant is fossilized and the associated fungi comes along for the ride. It gets trapped in the same conditions that trapped the plant. Now, animals have also become fossilized or preserved in ice or sediment or mud with parasitic fungi within their bodies. This fungi will get fossilized with its host, or its symbiote, as they're both exposed to the same geological conditions. One of the most ancient pieces of evidence is a small, branching microfossil in the shape and size of a hyphae, argued by its discoverers to be a specimen of the form genus Ornatophyllum. Now, perhaps the most mind-blowing evidence of an early fungal ancestor comes to us as an incredibly ancient fossil from the Tapania genus. A paper published in the journal Paleobiology examined this extinct genus, and the abstract of that paper says that Tapania morphology, quote, shows it to have been an actively growing, benthic, multicellular organism capable of substantial differentiation. Most notably, its septate, branching, filamentous processes were capable of secondary fusion, a synapomorphy of the higher fungi. Combined with phylogenetic, taphonomic, and functional morphological evidence, such hyphal fusion identifies Tefania reliably, if not conclusively, as a fungus, probably a sister group to the higher fungi, but more derived than the zygomycetes, unquote. All right, now that was a lot of technical terminology, and it might have been a little confusing. So to break this down a little bit, what they're essentially saying, what they're essentially describing, is a deep-sea-dwelling organism with a dynamic, branching, filamentous growth. 
which is just like a fungal mycelia. Furthermore, they have traits of modern-day fungi, like septa between their cells. They have filamentous growth forms, or these single-celled strings of hyphae. And these hyphae exhibit branching. They have specialized branching structures. It has all of the hallmarks of being one of the earliest fungal ancestors, as the fossils are dated at over a billion years old. That's ancient. Like, extremely ancient. Before the Cambrian explosion, ancient. This would have been among the earliest multicellular growth forms to evolve, only after the evolution of eukaryotic cells and then multicellularity itself. Although multicellularity actually evolved independently in a wide range of lineages, fungus included, it was from these marine-dwelling amoeboid organisms that the fungal lineage is believed to have emerged. One of the earliest ancestor groups of fungus are the chytridiomycotes, or the chytrids, which are microscopic organisms with chitin in their cell walls, and who use a saprotrophic, absorptive method of acquiring nutrients from biochemical detritus. These chytrids mostly reproduce asexually, by releasing a cloud of zoospores. A zoospore is a spore that's equipped with a single, little flagella, which is kind of like a tail, and these spores will whip their tail, or they'll whip their flagella back and forth to propel themselves through the water. A small minority of chytrid species reproduce sexually. These chytrids will release gametes into the water, which meet and fertilize. In some species, the gametes produced by each parent are the same size, and these are called isogametes. But in other species, the gametes produced by the parents are different sizes, and this is called oogamy where typically the male gamete, or what we refer to as the male gamete, is small and mobile, and the female gamete is large and relatively immobile. There's a couple other methods for sexual reproduction used by various chytrid species, which include the physical conjoining of a mycelial limb from each parent, like a rhizoid or a bit of hyphae. This conjoining creates a membrane-bound corridor for each parent to send their gametes, which meet somewhere in the middle of the tube to fertilize. These then bud outwards, growing out of the tube into a structure called a resting spore. The resting spore is like a bag or a balloon that's full of zoospores, and when the bag ruptures or opens on its own, the zoospores are released and they go swim somewhere else to germinate. The chytrid mycelia is primitive, very limited, and very rudimentary. And in some species, it doesn't exist at all. These chytrids are some of the earliest fungi, known from samples that are more than 400 million years old. And yet, we can already see the cellular and morphological and metabolic pathways that the fungal lineage is about to head down. These chytrid fossils are just some among many other species, all of them entombed in rock samples that come from an invaluable source of paleontological and evolutionary data. This site exists in central Scotland, where there sits a fossilized mass of sedimentary rock. This rock formed in the late Devonian period, close to 410 million years ago. It's an amazing rock formation, because trapped within its fossilized mass are the preserved bodies of numerous fungi, and lichens, and bacteria, and plants, and even small animals. This rock is called the Rhiney Chert, which is considered an example of Lagerstata. A Lagerstata is a sedimentary deposit that's rich with fossils, fossils that have been preserved in excellent condition. The Rhiney Chert is a particularly famous example, as it's filled with organisms from the Devonian era, like a massive slice of time that's been preserved for 410 million years. The timeline suggests that these organisms were members of the first lineages to colonize dry land, as this was a bit more than 130 million years or so after the Cambrian explosion. The Rhiney Chert first formed when volcanic hot springs filled a local body of water with silica compounds. All of this material caused the water level to rapidly rise, where it flooded the banks or the coast. The coastal ecology was really quickly engulfed in the silica-dense water. This matrix also provided the silica that would slowly fossilize all of the plants and animals and fungi 
caught up in the water. The fungi in the Rhiney chart are representative of some of the earliest originating lineages, like the chytrids, which I already mentioned. But these fossils also include some glomeromycetes and ascomycetes. Now, the chytrids in particular can be seen parasitizing a type of primitive vascular plant called a rhinophyte. Fungi from the lineages zygomycetes and basidiomycetes aren't readily abundant in the rhiny chert, and this is because the zygomycetes probably existed, but they, they weren't around in this particular geographic location, and the basidiomycetes, well, they just hadn't evolved yet. They hadn't yet emerged onto the world stage. So, of course, we wouldn't see any fossils of them yet. The largest organism fossilized in the Rhiney chert was a prototaxite, a member of a genus of terrestrial fungi that existed from 430 to 360 million years ago. So, like the chytrids, these were also some of the earlier fungi. On a molecular scale, the prototaxite specimens resemble primitive fungi. The growth forms are composed of masses of two types of cell structures. You have relatively thick, tube-like structures, which weave and wrap around each other like strands in a rope, and then you also have relatively thin, fiber-like hyphae that exhibit heavy branching. The branching hyphae interweave with the larger tube structures to form the overall mycelial tissue, which was apparently sturdy enough and strong enough to support their massive bodies. This, this huge amount of biomass. The prototaxites were apparently really large, growing mycelial bodies, or fruiting bodies, that resembled tree trunks. They could grow up to a meter wide, and they could reach 8 meters tall, or almost 25 feet tall. Near the tip, they would make short, rudimentary branches, which would grow into lobes, or clubs, that presumably released spores. There's some really fascinating evidence that suggests that these ancient fungi endured parasitic insects, burrowing into its flesh to make shelter. Little carved-out tunnels in insect-like patterns attest to this. And their presence in a wide age range of fossils suggests that prototaxites had endured these burrowing insects for millions of years. Now consider that, at the time, these fungal structures would have been the tallest things around. The tallest land plants were about a meter tall, and wood, or lignin, hadn't even really been evolved yet. When tougher vascularized stem tissue was evolved, and then when lignin emerged, the plants could support the weight and carry the water to grow really tall, too, and they outcompeted these prototaxite fungi, and so the prototaxites faded into extinction. The insects that evolved mouthparts for boring into prototaxites are believed to have shifted over to these newly dominant woody plants. Recent data suggests that prototaxites may not have been pure fungi, but they may have instead been an early kind of lichen, or a composite organism composed of multiple different species, of which some kind of fungal species would have been a participant. Other lichen were also preserved in the Rhiney chert, including a newly discovered genus called Winfrenachia. This newly discovered lichen genus has internal nets of hyphae that are all tangled up in the photobiont, which is probably some kind of cyanobacteria. These Winfrenachia fungi are believed to be an early relative of the zygomycetes, which I'll get into in more detail in a few minutes. Now, while the lichen are well preserved in the Rhiney chert, there are a few other sites that have prospective lichen fossils that are even older, like the 551 to 635 million year old fossils in the phosphorite of the Daoshantuo Formation of Wang'an County in south central China. All of these early lichen fossils tell us something important about fungi. Forming symbiotic relationships like those in lichen were a paramount part of the fungal lineage from the very beginning. Now, I should clarify that because lichens are a composite organism, they form when you have multiple species that meet in an evolutionary confluence, where they can all coexist with each other in a mutually beneficial way. These lichenization events have happened multiple times all throughout the history of fungal evolution, and they'll presumably keep happening in the future. <laughs> 
It's also important to understand that evolution is dynamic, and a lichen will only persist for as long as it's able. It's possible for the individual species within a lichen to evolve out of balance with one another, or to have their symbioses disrupted on an evolutionary level, to the point where the involved species de lichenize and grow to live on their own. Now, the Rhiney chert is fascinating, not just because of all of the individual fossils of fungi and lichen and plants, but because these fossils were all once living organisms, interacting in a dynamic, evolving ecosystem. Some of these ecological relationships are preserved in the fossils, and they give us valuable insights into how these organisms lived in their primordial world. Some plants, for example, have leaves that show bite marks or chewing damage and signs of healing and repair. Fossilized poop gives clues as to what the diets of larger organisms looked like, and the fossil selection itself gives insight into the structure of the waterside community more than 400 million years ago. With respect to the fungi, the Rhiney chert shows fungal specimens clinging to the roots of plants in an extremely early mycorrhizal relationship. Other fungal specimens seem to be frozen somewhere in a pathological rage, infecting and parasitizing species of plants and algae and animals. Some of the fossilized poop was full of spores, suggesting that fungal spores, and perhaps plant spores, were so common and so dense that larger organisms, like animals, could feed almost exclusively off of just the spores. Now, before I go any farther, I want to talk about the relationship between plants and fungi for just a few minutes, because these two kingdoms have had something of a love-hate evolutionary relationship. Plants and fungi are beautifully complementary. Plants grow tall, reaching high up into the dry air and the bright sunlight, where they can photosynthesize and produce sugars. The fungi grow laterally, on or within the soil, and detritus, using their huge surface area to creep into impossible places and absorb as much water and mineral nutrients as is physically possible. On their own, the plants and the fungi are optimized for the production or the extraction of certain resources. The sugars that the plant can easily make with sunlight are much harder to come by for the fungus, but the fungus can absorb water and nutrients way more efficiently than plants. Together, plants and fungi can move a huge amount of biological resources by combining their optimized strategies. However, the exact nature of this combination of strategies depends on the species of plants and fungi. Some plants and fungi exist symbiotically, in a peaceful mycorrhizal relationship, where the fungi is fed sugar in return for helping the plant get water and mineral nutrients. Now, many of these mycorrhizal relationships are extremely beneficial for all parties, and they have secondary benefits for other organisms in the ecosystem. For example, trees might struggle in poor soil, but a fungal symbiote can make the soil livable. If trees can live in an area in some region somewhere, then that provides a physical habitat to all manner of other organisms, like weeds, insects, birds, and arboreal mammals. This beneficial mutual symbiosis has deep roots, going back in time to the earliest colonization of dry land. It's believed that species of fungi were some of the first organisms to creep onto the land, and through their growth and metabolic activity, they slowly broke down the mineral bedrock into granules and particles. And as the fungi spread and lived and died, their own organic biomass contributed to this early soil. In effect, by breaking down the rock and dying and releasing their, their own biomass into this newly created uh, mixture of pebbles and particles, the fungi slowly created the first true soils. And then the early plants came out of the water onto a primitive and undeveloped landscape. The data suggests that the early plants were only able to hang on to life and spread because of the benefits they enjoyed from their fungal symbiotes from the fungi that had already colonized dry land and done their best to make it more accommodating for life. 
So to summarize, the fungi broke down the bedrock into the first flakes and granules and dust, and then when they died, they contributed their own biomass to the soil, and their own biomass could soak up rainwater, and so it could moisten the soil. And this wet granular matrix created by the fungi turned out to be perfect for not just plants, for their roots to dig into and find purchase, but also for incoming generations of burrowing animals, like insects. However, plants and fungi don't have a perfectly nice mutualistic relationship. Where many species have evolved these kinds of nice mycorrhizal symbioses, many other species have evolved some kind of parasitism. In very rare cases, the plant may parasitize the fungi, but in the vast majority of cases, the fungi finds a way to parasitize the plant, and the plant has to find a way to defend itself against the fungi. This dichotomy creates a repeating pattern of the fungi evolving an attack, and the plant evolving a defense, and then the fungi evolving another attack, and then the plants evolve another defense, back and forth for millions of years. This is the core mechanism of an evolutionary arms race, or a co-evolutionary relationship that shapes both groups. This dynamic provides a huge amount of selective pressure, fueling speciation and divergence in both the plants and the fungi. The parasitic fungi have evolved to engage in a kind of bio-warfare with their plant hosts, feeding off of them without necessarily killing them. Although I have talked about facultative saprophytes in the past, which are fungi that will parasitize and then will kill their host, and then eat their dead body and use its nutrients to, uh, to fuel the parasitization of other hosts, but in other cases of fungal parasitism, the strategy of the fungi seems to be focused on stopping the plant from reproducing. Fungal infections have evolved to target the seeds and the flowers and other reproductive structures of their particular plant host. The strategy here is that the fungi can scuttle the reproduction of the plant and prevent it from sexually reproducing. The ultimate strategy of the fungus here is to interfere with the production of genetic variety in their host, which might include alleles or allele combinations that can infer traits for resistance against the fungal parasite. The fungal species are pressured to find ways to stop or slow plants from evolving this resistance to the fungal parasitism. They literally try to stunt the plant's evolution as a defense. Even among the standard brutality and suffering of the natural world, that's a pretty cold move. The fungi aren't just infecting and parasitizing the plants, but they're proactively stopping the plants from evolving any kind of defense. They're keeping the plants as defenseless as possible. Alright, so let me shift gears here for a moment. Earlier in the episode, I talked very briefly about chytrids, which are some of the earliest true fungi, and which are known mainly by their presence in the Rhiney Chert, dated around 410 million years old. Now, obviously, the fungal lineage kept evolving and branching off, so after the chytrids, what came next? Now, before I answer that question, I want to clarify that most of the species I'm going to be talking about had already evolved by the time the Rhiney Chert had formed. By the late Devonian, most extant fungal lineages had already emerged, and they'd spread and adapted to their habitats and their ecological niche. So, with that said, first the chytrids appeared, the chytridiomycotes, and then came the blastocladiomycotes. The blastoclads make up an average size to a relatively small phylum, with some of the species sharing many similarities with chytrids, similarities like the ubiquity of asexual reproduction and a monocentric growth pattern. Other blastoclad species show a little more evolutionary advancement, with more extensive amoeba-like mycelium, and the capacity for sexual reproduction by releasing or contributing gametes to the local environment, which is usually an aquatic environment. Most profound, these blastoclads are the first fungi to exhibit a property of their life cycle called alternation of generations. Now, I've talked about this phenomenon of alternation of generations uh, in the plant series, and it also exists in an analogous format in many fungi. The gist of it is that the life cycle produces alternating diploid and haploid forms, 
which produce the other as an offspring. As such, the lineage of the plants walks back and forth between diploid and haploid, between sporophyte and gametophyte, and the fungi do this too. I talked about this in the previous episode on fungal reproduction. To briefly recap, the mycelia of most fungus is almost always haploid, and it chooses its reproductive partners based on a chemical signature called its mating type. Two prospective parent fungi will fuse their hyphae, and their gametes are mobilized. In some species, the parents create a whole new branching mycelia with dikaryotic cells, each cell in the new tissue having two separate nuclei, one from either parent. In other species of sexually reproducing fungi, actually in most species, I believe, one parent will donate their gametes into the body of the other parent, which then grows the dikaryotic mycelia as a branching part of itself, like a literally pregnant fungus. In either case, this step is plasmogamy. In the dikaryotic mycelia, reproductive structures called sporangia are generated en masse. They're generated in huge numbers. These sporangia have cells that undergo karyogamy. Where all of the other cells in the new mycelia are currently dikaryotic, the cells in the sporangia have diploid nuclei. The nuclei have fused through the process of karyogamy to produce diploid cells. These diploid nuclei in the cells of the sporangia will undergo meiosis to generate haploid spores, and these haploid spores are released to go and germinate somewhere into new mycelia. You can see the alternation of generations here, even though it's very, very brief. In these species of fungi, the diploid stage is a very short-lived mass, no larger than a few cells, which has the singular purpose of producing more haploid spores through meiosis. For comparison, consider plants, where all of the huge trees and the stuff that you see outside, those are all diploid. Now, the animals don't experience alternation of generations at all, but just for comparison's sake, Think of how we live our whole lives as diploid, and the only part of us that's haploid are the two gametes before they meet and fertilize. Now, even though the fungi are much more closely related to us and other animals than they are to plants, the fungi still retain this ancient life cycle mechanism. The fungi still retain this alternation of generations. Okay, so to tie all of this back into the original point, this mechanism of alternation of generations emerged in a blastoclad ancestor, which shared this quality with all of the rest of the fungi. The next branches to emerge in the fungal lineage include a small group of plant parasites called the Olpidioles, which were no doubt encouraged by the spread and proliferation of plants onto dry land. Then emerged the Entomoph thoromycota, and after them, the Kixelomycota, which both had species focused not on parasitizing plants, but on spreading throughout the soil. The traits for saprophytic feeding were encouraged and spread throughout these populations, and many species began to parasitize the insects, the rotifers, and the nematodes that they found crawling around with them in the dirt and the mud. Following these groups came the Mucoromycotina division, which contains three orders of more saprotrophic and parasitic fungi. This includes many species of the well-known zygomycotes, which are named after the zygosporangia that they produce, which are reproductive structures that create globular or spherical spores at the end of strands of hyphae. When you see a zygomycot mold growing on a piece of fruit, and it's undergoing sexual reproduction, it will probably look like a bunch of thin little hairs lifting upwards off the fruit, with little dark balls or spheres held up at the tips. These spheres produce one or more spores, which get released to form new mycelia. To attract a mate for this sexual reproduction, the zygomycotes will release a pheromone called trisporic acid, and this will attract other individuals of a complementary mating type. The next emergent lineage was the glomeromycotes, which was hugely important to life on land. The glomeromycot fungi are entirely asexual, and they're almost entirely unable to live on their own. 
These glomeromycote fungi require a symbiotic relationship with a plant in order to survive. This symbiotic relationship manifests itself in the form of arbuscular mycorrhizas. In this symbiotic growth form, the hyphae of the glomeromycote fungi will penetrate the root cortex, reaching between the cells to spread throughout the root tissue. The hyphae will penetrate the cell walls, but they don't penetrate the cell membranes themselves. Instead, they push into the cell membrane from the outside, creating a pocket or an invagination. If you were inside of the plant cell, you would see the membrane flex inward as it was stretched, but it wouldn't break or get punctured. This creates a hyphae that's wrapped in membrane and can thus engage easily in nutrient exchange. This mechanism sets up the basis of the arbuscular mycorrhizal relationship, which has enabled the host plants to colonize landscapes that would otherwise be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to colonize. And finally, we come to the last two groups, which are the two most recently emerged in the fungal lineage. We have the Basidiomycotes and the Ascomycotes. These two groups both have the same general reproductive strategy, but with slightly different structures involved. The Ascomycotes evolved structures called an ascus, or asci, which is like a long tube filled with ascospores. The ascomycotes are also called sac fungi, so named because the ascus is like a sac, or a bag for the spores. Now, the basidiomycotes evolved structures called a basidium, or basidia, which is like a thick club holding the basidiospores. The basidiomycotes, and to a lesser extent the ascomycotes, possess species that develop mushrooms, or other large fruiting bodies. The oldest evidence of these mushroom fruiting bodies is around 100 million years old. For a long time, the oldest known mushroom was a 90 million year old fossil. Another fossil, about 99 million years old, was discovered later. And another find, the most recent, is also the oldest, at around 115 million years old. These estimates suggest that the mushrooms as we know them were first evolved sometime when dinosaurs still roamed the Earth. It's really interesting to note that as the biological world diversified, more niches opened up. There were more species out there doing stuff, generating this particular biological byproduct, and performing that particular ecological function. To the fungi, who were typically the first species to colonize a new landscape on the early Earth, there were more species to prey upon, more species to parasitize, more species to form symbioses with, and all of this evolutionary opportunity led to the huge diversification of fungi over hundreds of millions of years. There were other events in the history of earthly evolution that also helped propel the diversity and abundance of fungi. The events that I'm thinking of specifically are mass extinction events. It seems to be a relatively consistent theme in paleontological research that mass extinction events, whether global or localized, tend to be followed in the geological record by a brief burst of fungal growth. Fungal spores are anomalously overrepresented in the fossil record immediately following mass extinction events, which is actually something that we might expect. During a mass extinction event, there tends to be some kind of external abiotic variable affecting life on a mass scale, like massive shifts in temperature, or massive changes in the oxygen content of the atmosphere or the oceans, or a meteor impact that vaporizes a chunk of the planet's crust. All of these environmental problems tend to kill plants and sea life, which then leads to the death of terrestrial herbivores and carnivores. These events are marked by widespread death at every level. Populations are scattered and species go extinct. Communities fracture and collapse. Ecological relationships dissolve. And everyone's fitness drops to near zero in a world that seems to be thrown into chaos. But if you're a fungus, this is potentially pretty great news for you. Because the landscape is now covered in the corpses of plants and animals, there's endless detritus for you to consume, 
and your predators and competitors for nutrients are probably all dead or extremely reduced in number. In this context, fungi can grow to a massive extent, operating as the planet's biological recyclers, taking the uncountable mass of recently dead organic matter and dissolving it back into base nutrients. They dissolve the detritus, they fertilize the soil with nutrients, and they make the bed, so to speak, for the eventual recovery and radiation of life. All right, well, that's about all that I wanted to cover for fungal evolution. Like I said at the beginning of the podcast, fungal evolutionary history is a long story because the lineage is ancient. It's shrouded in mystery because of the relative lack of fossils, especially in the early history. And it's complex because the fungi are complex. They're hyperdynamic, multifaceted organisms with a thousand different approaches to life nutrition, and reproduction. And hopefully, all of that will become clear as we go through the episodes in this series exploring the diversity of life in the Kingdom Fungi. And as always, thanks for listening. Oh.